in verse 50. 1 Samuel 17, verse 50. So David overcame the Philistine with a sling and a stone and smote the Philistine and killed him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. Verse 51. And David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him completely and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they fled. So this chapter is going to show us tremendous victory, as we have just summarized in these verses. And David we see as a great overcomer. And so may the Lord help us to, as we have said, more, see more of Jesus also in our lives, that we may be an instrument in his hand, that we may be like David, putting our trust in the Lord. And that's the only resource we have. We cannot put our trust, our confidence in ourselves, then we would fool ourselves. We can only put our confidence in the Lord. And that's what we do right now as we are gathered to his name. That is what we do on Sunday morning. That's when we do when we pray meeting or Bible study. We put our confidence in him collectively. But for each one, there's this challenge in this chapter to follow David in this sense that he absolutely put his trust in God. And in that sense, he was completely different compared with the rest of the nation. King Saul didn't do that. He was the king over this nation. But as we have seen the last time in 1 Samuel 16, Saul was set aside by God because God had seen this little shepherd boy when he was taking care of the sheep of his father. And God had seen him. And God said, this is my man. So God had chosen David to become the king according to God's heart. But the lesson for us is that we would be like David. Learn from the Lord Jesus that we would be here to please God, to be according to his heart. So if we start at the beginning of this chapter, I just want to make a link with what we saw the last time, that David represents a new order of things. He was the eighth in his family, I like the number seven because it speaks of completion and of perfection, and we often see that number in Scripture. But the number eight stands for a new order of things, a new beginning. And that's what God did with David. He started something new. God knew all along that the choice of the people was not right. And so they got the choice in Saul, and then they soon discovered this is not what we need. And so God now comes in with the man of his choosing, and that's what we have seen in chapter 16. Chapter 16 is such a wonderful summary. It, to me, it's like a cluster of stars. There are so many beautiful things in chapter 16. It is really worthwhile to meditate, read, over, uh, upon, read it, and reread it. It is very rich. But we have seen in chapter 16 one verse that I want to uh, refer to now in verse 18. And that was the testimony of a man, one of Paul's, Saul's servants, when Saul said in verse 17, provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. So they had to look for a man, and God used, used this opportunity to bring in David. And he does this through the testimony of this young man in verse 18. This young man said, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is the first point. That is a new, it's something absolutely new from Bethlehem, from Jesse. And the qualities he has, who is skilled or who knows to play. He's a valiant man. That's the third qualification. He is really a gibbor. That means a strong man. Although he was a little boy, he put his trust in God. And that is why he was a gibbor. That's one of the titles of the Lord Jesus, El Gibor, in uh, Isaiah 9, verse 6. He is a strong man. And so here you have qualities of David that we find in the Lord Jesus himself. A man of war, that is the fourth point. And then skilled or understanding or prudent in speech or in matters. 
So there was a special skill that characterized David. Sixthly, of good presence. Seventh, and that's the most important thing, Jehovah is with him. Can it be said of us, the Lord is with me? Not in a boastful way, but as we see in Genesis 39, several times about Joseph, that it could be said the Lord was with him. And I mentioned the last time, this is also said of the Lord Jesus. In Peter's testimony in Acts 10, he could say this, the Lord was with him. That is what characterized the Lord Jesus as a man on this earth. God was with him. And so these seven features really introduced David in his qualities. And now the time has come in chapter 17 that this man of God's choosing will be introduced publicly. In chapter 16, he is introduced into a private setting. He was anointed among his brethren, in the midst of his brethren. And he has this testimony of this man. But now he's going to be introduced publicly. But not before God has shown the total failure of Israel and Saul, the king. And even Jonathan doesn't show up in this chapter. Jonathan, the hero that we saw in chapter 14, he's nowhere to be seen here. So there is failure all around. First one, the Philistines assembled their armies to battle. You see, in the days of Samson, uh, Samson was an overcomer also. And so they had suffered through Samson's, Samson's attack. Then there was this great revival under Samuel, and the Philistines suffered there also. Then there was this um, victory by Jonathan, and then there was a war in chapter 14, we have seen that. And so they had several setbacks. In the beginning, they had great victories. They had taken the ark away. We have seen it in chapter uh, 4, 5, and 6. The ark came back. But they had been very successful, and Israel suffered about 20 years under this rule of the Philistines. And now they thought they had the chance to go to battle again. So they gathered together Soko, belongs to Judah, and they encamped between Soko and Azekah. In Ephes Damim. All these names have, of course, also a meaning, but I will not go into that now. And verse 2, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together. So they had to respond to this attack. And they encamped in the valley of the Terebinth. That's a beautiful place. This word valley is used a couple of times in the New Testament, and excuse me, in the Old Testament. And it is used once in the Psalms. It was really striking to me. Uh, or the word valley, no. The, the word valley is used often, but then the word ravine in verse 3. Let's read verse 3. The Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side. And the ravine, it was a kind of a valley, was between them. That was a steep valley, and that's used in Psalm 23. And that was striking to me to see that the only time that this word ravine or valley is used in Psalm 23 it is in verse 4. But David says, if I go through the valley of shadow of death, you are with me. It's amazing. That's the same word. So here, David is going to be in the valley of shadow of death. But we see in this chapter, the Lord is with him. The people were helpless. They were confronted by the Philistines. And they stood there. They were powerless. We'll see that uh, in more detail in the following verses. And so, as it were to demonstrate this impasse, we see then the actions of this strong man in verse 4. There went out a champion or a strong man. And the word champion here is really someone who is in between two camps. He is very powerful. So he went out from the camp of the Philistines. And his name was Goliath. Goliath means, has several meanings. Splendor, 
but also banishment, several meanings. But it really illustrates the power of Satan. In Goliath, we see a counterfeit. A counterfeit, it represents really the tremendous power of Satan, but it's a counterfeit to compete with God. What Goliath does, he's provoking God. We'll see that in a few moments. And what characterizes him is really the enemy who sets himself up against God. So God is marked by splendor, he Goliath. That is the counterfeit of the enemy. Um, whose height was six cubits and a span. Now, six is the number of men, but he tries to reach higher and a span. Now, if you study that in Scripture, this word span is really used in connection with God. God controls the whole universe, like it's in his hand, in a span. So I don't give the details now. You can work that out with a concordance, but it is really a reference of God's power. And so here we see in this counterfeit, he wants to reach to that point that he has the control, like God has. That is really behind it. That is what is behind the efforts of the enemy, to take over, to compete with God. That's going to happen, we'll see that in the overview at the end, in Revelation 13, this tremendous battle will take place in the future. It is really to uh, confront God. So this is a tremendous counterfeit. And in verse 5, you find the helmet. There are a few details that show his power. And the helmet of bronze, it was the Bronze Age, and he was clothed with a corslet of scales, very heavy. It's kind of counterfeit. God is clothed in an armor. You see that in Isaiah, uh, several passages. God is a man of war. God has an armor. And now this instrument of the enemy is really a counterfeit of God. And he's going to challenge God. When you read those verses, in verse 6, uh, it grieves of bronze upon his legs and a javelin of bronze between his shoulders. And the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. You wonder, what is this? Can this man actually move? I remember as a little kid, my father used to read this story. We always asked for this story. If he asked for a story to read, we always asked for the story of Goliath. I don't know about you, but we were very impressed by that story. And so when you hear those details, it's unbelievable the power that this man represents. You wonder, was he able to move with all that weight on him? And then the shield bearer went before him. Actually, there are six points that mark uh, this man. So he was the height of six cubits and a span, reaching out to be higher. And um, these six features really represent what man can do. Number six, six, six. As we have in Revelation 13. And there he stands in verse 8 and cried to the ranks of Israel. So he's defying them and said to them, why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine? Really? You don't say that. Am I not the Philistine? So in him is represented the power of the Philistines. But he was really a descendant of the Anakim. We find that in Joshua. I have it on the, on the slide. Joshua 14, also in, excuse me, in Numbers 13. Joshua 11 also, there's several references so that this Goliath came from the Anakim, and there were also Anakim in Gath. Those Anakim were the old uh, inhabitants of the land, and they represent the powers against God. The promised land was held by the powers of the enemy, and he wanted to keep the people of God away from the promised land. And so they had to come in and to wipe them out. God, under Joshua, uh, used Joshua to wipe them out. But he didn't co complete the job. Here, this Philistine, or this uh, Goliath, was one of those descendants of the Anakim, and there he is. And he challenges Israel, and he says, choose for yourselves a man. Remember, King Saul had said, look for me or provide me now a man. 
God's going to provide him. Hear the challenge of Goliath. Choose for yourselves a man and let him come down to me. For 40 days, Israel tried to find a man. They didn't find him. King Saul, the strong, tall man, he didn't dare to take up this challenge. His son, Jonathan, the hero, didn't dare to take up this challenge. There was no one. And so after 40 days, as we see later, God brings in his man. So this challenge will be answered, but in a way that is unexpected. Choose for yourselves a man. That's a challenge. But God had one ready. God had one ready already a long time before, but God was waiting. You know, God is patient. He waited all those 40 days, and he let them wait. Verse 9. If he be able to fight with me and to smite me, then will we be your servants. Servants is really the same word as Obed. It is bond servants. And Obed is really a servant forever. That's what the Philistines wanted. But if I overcome and smite him, then shall ye be our servants and servers. And the Philistines said, now notice, this is very, very solemn. I have defied the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man, so he repeats his challenge, that we may fight together. God is not indifferent for such a challenge. God is going to answer this challenge. We see that also in the history of Israel, in a later date. Remember the Assyrians when they came? They challenged God, this, uh, the representative of King Sennacherib. His uh, spokesman, he challenged God. He challenged Hezekiah in Israel, in uh, Jerusalem at that time. And because of that challenge, God wiped them out in one night. Through one angel, 185 uh, Syrians were killed. God is not indifferent. When such a challenge comes to him, he will answer it. Another example is in the book of Daniel, Daniel 5, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. He organized a feast, and he had defied God. And God sent a hand of a man, wrote uh, many, many take ufar sing. And Daniel was brought in to explain that uh, saying, and he showed that God had given him time, and he had not humbled himself like Nebuchadnezzar had done. And so they had defied God, drinking from the golden vessels that came from the temple. They defied God, and God is not indifferent to that defiance. And so God entered. That same night, this king was killed. So this challenge will be answered. And then in verse 11, Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, and they were dismayed and greatly afraid. You can see that from a human perspective. But what was their failure? They did not introduce God into the picture. But after my failure and our failure, that in a difficult situation, we failed to bring in God. In Joshua, uh, Joshua, before he went in, in the promised land to take out those strong giants and so on, in Numbers we see that the people didn't dare to go in. They had no faith, except for Caleb and Joshua. Now Joshua comes here, and so Joshua is challenged, and he sees then the captain of the host in Joshua 5. In Joshua 1, the Lord says to him, Be not, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Joshua was going to be this man, and he came in and took out most of these giants. And now the same is said here, of Israel, they were not like Joshua, they were dismayed. They were afraid, greatly afraid. So instead of doing what Joshua did, put his trust in God, they did not do that. But there is more in this chapter. This chapter also illustrates the tremendous battle between God and Satan, and how David is here a picture of the Lord Jesus who overcame these tremendous powers of the enemy. Be we cannot really fully fathom the power and the control of the enemy. But I'll give you a few references. Like in Hebrews 2, verse 14 and 15, we see that through death, uh, Satan kept those under his control out of fear 
So there we see Satan and the power of death. We see also Satan in connection with the power of this world. He is the god of this age. He has tremendous power and he deceives. Uh, we see that in uh, 2 Corinthians 3, that he is the god of this age who blinds, in chapter 4, who blinds the mind of man. So he, over against that tremendous power of the enemy, where we, have, we are no match, only the Lord Jesus was able to overcome that tremendous power. That is also illustrated in this chapter. And then in verse 12, now David was the son of that Ephratite Bethlehem. So now our attention is turned from this um, scene of extreme um, weakness. But you know, sometimes we say this, man's extremity is God's opportunity. This situation was so extremely difficult and dangerous and without solution, that became God's solution to bring in the man of his choosing. And that's how the Holy Spirit turns our attention now to verse 12 to David. Now David. So this is how God introduces the man of his choosing over against all this failure of Israel confronted by this Philistine. And so David came from Bethlehem, Judah. And you see in the book of Ruth, his uh, uh, grand great-grandparents. You see how he was the son of Jesse, who was the grandson of Boaz and uh, Ruth. And Jesse had eight sons. I mentioned already earlier, the number eight represents this new order because David was the eighth. He was also the seven, according to other chrono chronology, but he was also the eight. So the number seven, perfection, the number eight, new order. And Jesse was old in the days of Saul. So Jesse could not go to war, but his sons went. We see that in verse 13. Um, the three eldest sons. Now you remember the last time we met those three sons in chapter 16. And when Samuel saw these three sons, he was so impressed. He thought, they just look like King Saul. Maybe this one is the one that God has chosen. But then God explained to David, no, I have rejected him in 16 verse 7. For it is not as man sees, for man looks upon the outward appearance, but Jehovah looks upon the heart. We talked about it the last time. And the same is Abinadab, verse 8, and the same is Shammah, verse 9. The Lord says he has not chosen them. And then the other four were not chosen either. So none of those seven sons qualified. And so here, now we see David brought in the eighth, and he qualified. And so those three strong ones in whom uh, Samuel put his trust wrongly, these strong ones are with Saul. They are on the same line as Saul, but they do not dare to take the challenge of the Philistine. And then David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So we've seen that David was brought to the palace. He would play when Saul had this attack by the uh, evil spirit. And then he would calm down by the music that David made. And so then after this uh, difficult time for Saul, David was allowed to go back and take care of the sheep. So here we see David as a true shepherd. He did not forget about the sheep. He went back to take care of these sheep. And in David, we see here also an example for us to be an instrument fit for the master's use. David is in training here. David is in God's school. He learns how the things are at, at the court, in the palace. At the same time, he learns behind the sheep. And we'll see more about it in a few moments, how he learned behind the sheep, how he learned to trust God. There it was, not only that he learned the truth of the valley of shadow and death, there it was he learned to play and to sing those songs for the honor and glory of God. And so I, as David is here an instrument in God's school, so we, each one of us, we are in God's school 
to be taught, to be trained, to be formed, so that the Lord can use us the mo- when the right moment has come. He was taking care of those sheep. You remember the contrast with Saul? Saul, he always lost things. The donkeys were gone, he couldn't find them. But David is a true shepherd. He takes care of the sheep. What a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus. He never neglects his sheep. He always takes care of us. He's the great shepherd. And then in verse 16, the Philistine drew near. So now our attention is brought back after this little inter, uh, interruption, intermezzo. We see how the Philistine is reintroduced. He drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. So here's the Philistine again, representing all the power of the enemy. And he comes near morning and evening. It reminds me of the morning and evening sacrifice. Three, six, uh, nine o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the afternoon. And this is again, this is the challenge of the enemy. As I said earlier, he really is a counterfeiter. And so in this sense also, Israel was used to do the morning and evening sacrifice, but he draws the attention to himself. And secondly, he presents himself. It reminds me of uh, the Antichrist, how he will present himself being God, 2 Thessalonians 2. That's going to happen soon. Soon the Lord will come, and then this Antichrist will reveal himself in the temple of God that will be revealed, re- rebuilt in Jerusalem. And he will present himself. And it says here, 40 days. The Lord was in the wilderness 40 days. That was a time of testing. Um, When Noah was in the ark, 40 days was raining like buckets. And the 40 days uh, we find many times in Scripture. It's a period of complete testing according to man's responsibility. Israel was responsible here. They had no answer. They failed miserably. And so those 40 days are a time of testing. And then God introduces, after this failure, the man of his choosing. Verse 17, how this comes about is, Jesse said to David his son, Take, I pray, for thy brethren this ephah of parched corn and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to thy brethren. As Joseph was sent by his father to take to inform himself of the welfare of his brethren. So now David is sent by his father. And notice it says, carry them quickly. I said earlier that David is the great overcomer in this chapter. This word quickly indicates that also. It is the zeal of the overcomer. And we'll see a few more times how David ran. And this word quickly indicates that. That is what we find in the New Testament for the overcomers, marked by diligence. And this is what God wants us to be, overcomers, marked by this zeal, spiritual zeal, not carnal zeal, spiritual zeal. And then he was going to bring those Jesus to the captain of the thousand, verse 18, and visit thy brethren to see how they are. Like Moses was going to see how his brethren were doing. In Exodus, it's like the Lord who came to see, he came to his people, they didn't recognize him. And the same here with David, when his father says, take a pledge of them, he was wounded in the house of his brethren. They despised him. It says in Zechariah 13 that these wounds were the pledge that the people gave him. That is the pledge they gave him. Then we'll see the Lord visit the wounds. That is what man has done to him. That is what his people have done to him. That is the pledge they gave him when he went back. And so it's very striking to see that those wounds, Zechariah 13, are really speaking of the Lord in the New Testament. In the Gospels we see that. We had it with the young people yesterday evening a little bit. These wounds will be seen forever and ever. That's the pledge that man has given him. Verse 19, now Saul and they and all the men of Israel, now we are back to the situation again, were in the valley of the Terebinth, fighting against the Philistines. But they were doing nothing. There were no overcomers. There was no one who could take the challenge. 
They, ju- they were just there. Forty days. Utter weakness. Verse 20. David rose up early. There's the overcomer. He rose up early in the morning. He's obedient. His father sent him. He goes. Another mark of the Lord Jesus is obedience. What we see with Joseph also. He left the sheep with a keeper. He is a good caretaker. He has, um, he does not neglect anything. He gives them in the hand of the keeper. Took his charge and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the wagon defense and the host was going forth to the battle array, shouted for the fight. So that's now the 40th day. Israel and the Philistines put the battle in array, rank against rank. They didn't do anything. They just heard this challenge in verse 22. When David left the things he has, he was carrying in the hand. So and the other uh, element of delegation, he delegated the sheep to the care of the of a caretaker. He now delegates the care of these goods he had in his hand to a caretaker, and then ran into the ranks. Again, the feature of the overcomer. And came and saluted his brethren. The word saluted here is, say, shalom. And so, there is where he is now. In verse 23, he talked with his brothers. And then the champion comes up, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the ranks of the Philistines, and spoke according to the same words, and David heard them. So this is the 40th day now. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him. See, they are panic-stricken. We're greatly afraid. Like Israel, when uh, the Egyptians f- pursued them, they had left after the, uh, the, uh, the, la- the Passover lamb, and then Pharaoh pursued them, and they were greatly afraid. This is, again, an illustration of the fear of that the enemy instills the people, Hebrews 2, he controls the people by this fear. They are not doing anything. But David was not afraid. We're going to see that. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that comes up? Verse 25, For to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who smites him, will him will the king enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. That means not having to pay taxes. 26, and David spoke to the man that stood by him. David informed himself. He wanted to have this repeated to him. What shall be done to the man that smites this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? And now notice, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God. David sees the things from God's perspective. Saul and his men, they all saw the things only from man's perspective. And they were afraid. But David, this little shepherd boy, he sees what is really going on. He understands this challenge, this defying language of the, of the Philistine was really a defiance against God. He defied God. And those weak armies of Israel, they were the armies of the living God. This expression, the living God, so important. We find it 28 times in the Bible. 15 times in the Old Testament, 13 times in the New Testament, together 28 times. The living God. David drew his resources from the living God. And he understood that the living God, he will take care of this problem. He understood that this Philistine was really challenging God. And God will not be indifferent to that challenge. Now David, he is willing to become the instrument in God's hand. So they repeated in verse 27, so shall it be done to the man that smites him. It takes a man. And that is going to be David. The challenge of the giant Provide me a man, choose for yourselves now a man, and let him come down to me, let him fight with me. This challenge is now going to be taken by David. But in the meantime, what do we see in verse 28? Eliab, his eldest brother, heard while he spoke to the man, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. Eliab had failed 
He was a strong man. He should have taken this challenge, but he had failed. So had all the people. And so there was this jealousy from uh, Eliab towards David that where Eliab had failed, he saw that in David there was something, an element that he did not have. And so he became jealous. He became angry. That is the jealousy of the Jews towards the Lord Jesus. Pilate knew that they had delivered him out of jealousy. And verse, the verse goes on to say, Why art thou come down, and with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? We have seen David was a very good caretaker. He did not neglect anything. So this was a false charge. And so the Jews had false charge against the Lord Jesus many times. And then he says, it's a false accusation. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of your heart. So this is a false accusation. So this is really a picture of the hatred of his own brother towards David. A picture of the Jews, the leadership of the Jews towards the Lord Jesus. There was always a remnant who estimated the Lord, who appreciated him, but the leadership was just like Eliab. False accusations. Even in the end of verse 28, for thou art come down that thou might see the battle. All these false accusations, how terrible. And David said, is David going to defend himself? He only says, what have I now done? So he doesn't even defend himself in this situation. And there are situations also where we have to just leave it with the Lord. Those false accusations. You try to fight those false accusations, you only get more trouble. But leave it with the Lord. That's what we have to learn. That's what David did. And he says, was not laid upon me. That's a bit difficult to understand. Is there not a cause? So there was something on his heart, but uh, Eliab could not understand that, of course. But that was David's simple answer. And so he just turned away from him in verse 30. And that's, there are situations that you just have to leave it with the Lord and turn away. And he went to another, and he spoke after the same manner. So David gets the same story repeated over again. So it is to reassure him, this is what the king has said. And the people answered him again after the former manner. So David is now well informed, and he knows this is the situation. And so while David is speaking, in the meantime, there's a messenger going to the king in verse 31. And then King Saul sends for him. And in verse 32, David comes before Saul and notice what he says. Let no man's heart fail because of him. The people were all weak. But he says to Saul, he gives a great encouragement. Let no man's heart fail. Remind us of Paul on the ship on board ship there. Everybody is afraid that the storm will wipe them out and then Paul is able to encourage them. So here, in this desperate situation, David is able to give a word of encouragement. How often we need that too, a word of encouragement. And not only that, a word of commitment. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Thy servant is seven times in First Samuel. Thy servant is many times in the Old Testament. I counted them 14 times, 7 times. It's amazing. So this is a precious expression. Thy servant means that David made himself available also for King Saul and for the people. And so what does Saul say in verse 33? Thou art not able. See, with Saul there was no faith. With David, there was faith. And so Saul says, as it were, that doesn't make sense. A little shepherd boy against this walking fortress. We have seen all those details, the strength of Goliath that was invested in Goliath. That doesn't make sense. You're just a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. As I saw earlier, I said earlier, Goliath was really competing with God. He was... It was the enemy's counterfeit to really challenge God. 
But David was taking that challenge, and that's how God works. In 1 Corinthians 1, we see that God uses weakness to confront man's power. God uses what seems to be foolish, the foolishness of the cross, to challenge man's wisdom. So God's wisdom and God's power is seen in things that are despicable, that are not really anything in the view of man. And that's the situation here. David represents something that is to be despised. Who would think that a shepherd boy can take up this challenge of this tremendous giant? Who could understand that God would take up the challenge of learned man, like the Greek, or the Jewish leaders, and then confront them with the cross? Utter weakness. And in this utter weakness, you could read in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, God was the great overcomer through the Lord Jesus. And here in this utter weakness of David, we see that God's going to use David to be the great overcomer. And how could David speak this language? God had taught him. I said earlier he, had been in, he was in God's school. And so we are in God's school. God is teaching us. We learn all the time. And what did David learn in verse 34? Thy servant fed his father's sheep. So as a shepherd boy, he learned lessons. Psalm 23, you can see that. And there came a lion. And also a bear. And took a lamb out of the flock. See, that is the two uh, ways that the enemy attacks. Either as a lion, a uh, roaring lion, First Peter 5, or as a bear, a bear that uh, just squeezes his prey without any noise. Satan has mainly two different tactics. When he cannot get us this way, he will get us the other way. But David was taught in the school of God that he could fight the enemy on those two fronts. And so this is what God wants to teach us in the school of God, that whether the enemy comes like a lion or he comes like a bear, we're prepared to face him. Perhaps in, in the Western world we face him more as a bear, in the lands where there's persecution more as a roaring lion, but we need to be ready to face him both ways. And that's how David learned this. And David uh, came out as an overcomer. He took the lamb out of the... Uh, excuse me, in verse 35. I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I seized him by his beard and smote him and slew him. That's in reference to the lion. And so David was taught in God's school to take up the lion and also the bear. And that is why there is a reference in the New Testament. Uh, this illustration, this, um, what David is doing here against the Philistine is really confronting the enemy. And the Lord Jesus, in his weakness, he overcame the strong power of the enemy. I just want to read a few verses and then we go on in this chapter. But I referred already to Hebrews 2. I just want to read that well-known verse. It is very striking. Hebrews 2, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Lord Jesus, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him, that had the power of death, that is the devil. So the devil used his power because he had gotten the power of death through Adam and Eve's disobedience. And now he uses that as a tool to keep everything under his control. And verse 15, the Lord came in to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So that is Really what happened here in 1 Samuel 17, the fear of death. That was the way that the enemy controlled the whole people during their lifetime, and they were in bondage this way. The, only the Lord was able to come in as a um, deliverer. 
And if you took, uh, go to Colossians 2, in connection with the cross, we see that the Lord Jesus had the victory. And I think that 1 Samuel 17 also is an illustration of that battle. In Colossians 2, I refer to the cross as the utter weakness, that in this utter weakness, the Lord Jesus was the great overcomer over the powers of the enemy. And it says in Colossians 2, 14 and 15, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So through this means of utter weakness, the cross, the Lord Jesus overcame all the powers of the enemy, exposed them, and as Goliath had challenged the people, now the Lord Jesus, there on the cross, in utter weakness, he challenges the powers of the enemy and overcomes them and has the victory. That is how God works through weakness, tremendous victory. And so that's also an illustration in 1 Samuel 17. And that is a unique battle, of course, between the Lord and Satan. We cannot go into that. But we are involved in other battles because the Lord has allowed Satan to go on and have some time of control of power. So he is, in principle, totally defeated, as we saw in Colossians 2 and Hebrews 2. But the Lord allows him to go on for a while under God's control, not out of control, but under God's control. God allows the enemy still to go on in his hatred. I refer to the roaring lion. God allows that. But God is in absolute control. The enemy cannot do anything beyond that control. And so that's where we are, and that's where we need to be overcomers. Not in this uh, battle as between the Lord and Satan, but in a battle where the Lord allows Satan still to go on here to try to regain territory. And that is also the illustration of 1 Samuel 17 for us, that this chapter has been given to help us to see the challenge for us and how we need to introduce the Lord himself through faith in the situation because in ourselves we are no match for the enemy. And so let's go on in 1 Samuel 17 for a few more moments. So now David, after he spoke to Saul, is saying that he... Uh, thinks that the enemy has defied the armies of the living God. And then David says in verse 37, Jehovah who delivered me or rescued me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. David is a shepherd. He rescued that sheep from the power of the enemy. And so he is still the shepherd also of the nation of Israel. And he will take care of Israel so that they will be delivered from this control of the enemy. Here is David's faith, and this is also an example for us. And then Saul said, go, and Jehovah be with thee. But then immediately after that, Saul denies what he was saying, because then Saul says in verse 38, Saul clothes David with his dress, with his helmet, and so on. So they, he said to David, go, and Jehovah be with thee. He should have let David go, but then... Saul denies what he's been saying by giving that, uh, this armor, his own armor, to David. But that is man's thinking. That is according to the flesh. You read Jeremiah 17, that every thought that comes of the flesh is absolutely not valid for God, that does not um, have any value for God. And so this is a tremendous test for David. He takes the test and he passes the test. Instead of putting his trust in this armor of King Saul, he realizes, no, I cannot put my trust in that armor. And that's a lesson for us too. In Ephesians 6, we, see need, to, we need to strengthen ourselves in the grace which is in Christ Jesus, uh, 2 Timothy 2. We need to strengthen ourselves in the Lord, Ephesians 6. We need to uh, close ourselves in the armor of God, Ephesians 6. That is what we need, not the armor of man, 
And so David, he passes the test. He says that he had not tried it yet. And so this was the severe test, and he just put them off. Yesterday at the conference, we were thinking of 2 Corinthians 10. That Paul says the weapons, the armor uh, of our fight is not carnal. So the arms or the weapons of our fight or our battle are not carnal. He just puts them off, and that's what we need to do. Not trying to find our resources in carnal means to fight the battle. That's only a hindrance. And so David understands that. He passes this test gloriously. And what does he do next? Verse 40. He took his staff. So now he's going to use his own means that he had been using, that he had learned in the school of God to put his trust in God. So he uses the shepherd's staff in his hand, his control. He chose five smooth stones. The stones remind us of living stones. We are connected with the Lord Jesus, the living stone. Those stones can be used in the fight against the enemy. Not anything of man. And those stones came from the brook. They had been touched by the water of the brook. They had been made smooth. So we uh, have to go through God's school to become smooth stones that God can use. And he took five stones. That is how careful he was. If the first stone would not work, he would have other stones. Of course, he put his trust in God, and God um, led David so that the very first stone was successful. And in that sense, we can think that the four other stones were left for Goliath's four brothers. From other passages, we know that Goliath had four brothers, and they all were killed later by, uh, by other men of David. And so we can see it that way also. And he put them in the shepherd's bag in verse 40. Again, the shepherd, he's the shepherd taking care of his sheep. He's working here. And his sling was in his hand. So he uses, he's going to use the means that he has learned to use in God's school. And so he drew near to the Philistine. Not afraid. In God's strength, putting his trust in God well prepared from God's perspective. And so when the Philistine saw him in verse 41, and then verse 42, he looked at him and he saw David, he despised him or disdained him. You can understand that. For the enemy to be defeated by the cross, what a tremendous um, offense is this. The enemy is so powerful And the Lord Jesus overcame the enemy by the weakness of the cross. It was a tremendous, um, how should I say? That is, the enemy must have felt very much despised. The Lord despised him. God despised this tremendous giant, and he must have felt that God despised him, that David despised him. And yet, David was going to have the victory. This is... The enemy's reaction, but it goes together with how God despised this enemy. The enemy had challenged God, provoked God, and now God is going to despise him. And so he, f- he feels that uh, reproach. Because David was youth, was ruddy, and besides of a beautiful countenance, what could a young man like that do against this tremendous giant? What can we in our own strengths do against the enemy? Nothing. But David didn't come in his own strengths. David came in the strengths of the Lord. And that's why Paul says to Timothy, strengthen yourself in the grace which is in Christ Jesus. That's what he says to all of us, to strengthen ourselves in his strengths, not in our own strengths. Some people think if you have studied 20 years, that's good enough to face the enemy. No. We have to rely on God. Of course, we have to learn. But our school often is longer than 20 years in God's school. God takes his time. And so God has prepared David from his youth, and now the time has come to take on this giant. He says, and that shows how he feels uh, this, this, how he feels this reproach. Am I a dog? 
that you come to me with staves. So he's very much offended by this approach. The Lord Jesus was despised. Isaiah 53 and other scriptures bear that out. And yet he was going to be the great victor, the great overcomer. And so the enemy must have felt offended by this utter weakness. But in this utter weakness, David was going to have the victory. In his utter weakness on the cross, the Lord had a victory over all the powers of the enemy. In our weakness, what did Paul have to learn? 2 Corinthians 12. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. He had to learn that in God's school. You read 2 Corinthians 12. It's amazing that this powerful apostle had to learn to become weak so that then the Lord could use him as an instrument in the battle against the enemy. That's the same for us. When we put our trust in ourselves, the Lord cannot use us. But when we put ourselves, our trust in him, then he can use us. And the Philistine even cursed David by his God. So he was not only reproached by this utter weakness, but now he even cursed David. And then the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field. David said, and now notice there are seven points in verse 45 and following. You come to me with sword and with spear and with javelin, but I come to thee in the name of Jehovah of hosts. Not in his own strength. The God of the armies of Israel whom thou hast defied. Secondly, verse 46, this day will Jehovah deliver thee up into my hand. Thirdly, I will smite thee. Fourthly, I take thy head from thee. Fifthly, I will give the carcass of the camp of the Philistines this day to the fall of the heavens and the wild beasts of the earth. Sixthly, all the earth shall know that Israel has a God. So that challenge of Goliath will be answered this day. And all the earth will know it. Seventh, all this congregation shall know that Jehovah saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is Jehovah's. And he will give you into our hands. You, they say plural, so not only Goliath, all the Philistines would be given into the hands of David. That would be the victory of David and his people. That's the victory that God wants to give us. Not through might and power, but through him in our weakness, in putting our trust in him. And so the Philistine rose, came, advanced to meet David. He gets closer. David hasted, again, the overcomer. He ran, we saw earlier. Now he hasted. There's not carnal haste. Now the time has come. And ran towards the ranks to meet the Philistine. So here we see David as the true overcomer in spiritual zeal and confidence in God. David put his hand into the bag, took then a stone and slung it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. That's the pride. The forehead speaks in scripture of the pride. This man was very proudful, boasting, and now the stone sank in his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. Verse 50 is the seventh point. You can go over these points. You'll see that David is marked as the overcome by seven points. He overcame the Philistine, that's the summary, with a sling and a stone and smote the Philistine and killed him and there was no sword in the hand of David. We read that earlier, this verse. David ran, again the overcomer, and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of his cheese and killed him completely. So there is this complete victory of the cross that we saw in Colossians 2 and Hebrews 2 and cut off his head. This is very definite. This is a very definite victory. There's no compromise whatsoever. It's very radical, very definite. And when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, the strong man, the hero is really the Gabor, the strong man, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted, the, the, the shout of victory, pursue the Philistines until thou comes to the ravine or the valley and the gates of Ekron. This the ravine is the same as in verse 3, the ravine. And that is the ravine or the valley of shadow of death. And so that is not often used in scripture, but this is where this battle took place. And so then 
there is a victory over the Philistines. They pillaged their camps, and then David took the head of the Philistine. Where did he bring it? To Jerusalem. David had already in mind the complete victory that would come later, when they would also take over uh, Jerusalem. Partly was already taken by Israel. You find it in the book of Judges. But, so there was a part that belonged to Israel, and he was going to bring that head there later. Not the same day, of course, but that took place later. And he put the armor in his tent. And then we see that Saul did not recognize David. Abner didn't know whose son he was. Why does Saul ask this? Whose son is this young man? Because his family would be free of taxes. So Saul had to know whose father, uh, uh, whose father, who was his father, whose father, uh, who his name was. And so that's why he asked this question to Abner, and Abner doesn't know it. And then as David returned, verse 57, Abner took him, brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand, and Saul said to him, Whose son art thou? So that's again in connection with this promise. Whose son art thou, young man? And David said, I am the son of thy servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. So we have to stop here. This is a very long chapter, many lessons, and if you take the time to go over the slides I have, you will see many details, but we cannot do that now. But it is very interesting. All the lessons that we learn in this long chapter, either in connection with the Lord Jesus or in connection with us, many practical lessons, as I have in the summary at the end of this list, you see many practical lessons for us, there is also some information of the background, the Philistines, where they came from, what they mean. But we have to stop here. You can go over this in your leisure and see how this chapter also is really very helpful for us today and has many lessons for us today. And so may we be encouraged to follow David, to be an overcomer in God's school and to be an instrument in God's hand. I often pray, Lord, help me to be an instrument fit for the master's use. And we all can pray that, to be an instrument fit for the master's use. And that is how the Holy Spirit wants to use a chapter like this, to train us, to encourage us, to be an instrument fit for the master's use. So if there's a question to conclude this, I'll give you a few moments for that. Thank you. There is a cause. And the Lord... Mm -hmm. Good. Well, thank you for your attention. May the Lord bless his word and help us to be overcomers for his name's sake. Amen.